So if you've been following along in this little series of ours then, uh, on intercultural communication, then you know that culture is the learned and shared set of symbols, language, values, and norms used to distinguish one group of people from another. So learned and shared are key there. And where do we do more learning and sharing than in the classroom, right? Well, in an educational setting, culture is an incredibly important part of our educational systems and and uh, so I uh, want to spend a little bit of time today talking about education and how it intersects with intercultural communication. So uh, first of all let's identify some of the differences and acknowledge some of the differences in educational systems not in great detail but just, just on a spectrum here as you can tell we're, we're on a continuum here of of how things may be different from one educational system to another and this is true for educational systems from where you're at to the next town, but certainly, and there are differences there, and certainly differences uh, in other parts of the world, and just, you know, people approach education differently. And so there are differences uh, that we can see, for example, in the formality, the level of formality of the education and the educational system. Some are very, very formal and rigid, you know, think traditional English boarding schools and things like that that are super rigid, a lot of rules and a lot of uh, very set ways of doing things, not only traditionally in the classroom, but also outside of the classroom. And then there are some that are a little less formal, right? Right? Some 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 schools you may have heard of that, that maybe don't use grades, for example, don't use A, B, C, and they use different symbols or whatever. So maybe less formal, um, or maybe even some some another all kinds of different types of homeschooling. But there's you know in there's some home homeschooling is very much informal. It's very experiential and and not as classroom oriented. And it's, so that's true of all different educational systems. So you, can, you have different levels of formality. In these educational systems and uh, and just a reminder that when we talk about culture when we talk about differences in these things we're not talking about right or wrong or good or bad necessarily we're talking about different that's it just different different ways of doing things so different levels of formality that we have here uh, emphasis on memorization versus emphasis on experiences so here we're talking about how much are we, you know, I grew up in an educational system, you know, in my, in the, in the 19, uh, you know, I graduated in 1993 from high school. So uh, at that time, and for, for years prior to that, it was all about, you know, okay, memorize these dates from history and memorize these mathematical formulas and, and then show me on a test that you can regurgitate and repeat this information and so forth. So there was a real uh, emphasis on memorization. Now we're starting to, in recent um, decades, starting to recognize the importance of experiences. And that's also, that's been true over time. That's why we've always had apprenticeships, for example, back in the olden days. You might not go to school. You might take on and be taken on as an apprentice for some trade. Uh, but And now we have kind of a similar thing, except it's not a formal apprenticeship program, but this, this recognition that all oh, experiences are really good. So you have schools that are, you know, as you get older, you may have half a day in the classroom, but then another half day working in the field where you maybe intend to or hope to work. So you get some experience and some exposure to that. Um, I can tell you, uh, from an educational perspective, and I don't teach education, but I can tell you in my experience, a lot of students who want to study education, they really are excited about it until they get their first field experience, until they go out and do a little student teaching. And then they're like, ooh, I don't know if this is right for me. You see a lot of students um, make the decision not to go into teaching once they've had that, you know, firsthand experience. And that's, that's okay. That's good. That, that recognition is good. But also, you know, if you're going to work in that field, it's good to have some experiences there. So trying to find that balance and, and, and what's that emphasis on memorization versus experiences. Um, and so, um, anyway, so differences in perspectives on that. Uh, differences in the idea of, of general, uh, general education versus occupational communication. Again, when I was growing up, it was more college oriented, whether you go into college or not. It was basically a college path for the most part, um, even if you had no intention of going to college. So this general education, this broad education, which I, I think is important for people to have whether you want to major in history, it's important for us to understand history. Whether you want to study these things specifically, it's important that we have a good general scope. But now there is more emphasis on, okay, what specifically is going to be important for you in your occupational field? Let's focus on that and let's, let's cut out some of this other stuff. Um, um, so, um, and you see this in educational systems here in the United States, for example, associate's degrees, for example, tend to be more occupationally or, uh, oriented than higher level degrees, for example. So if you're getting an associate's degree, you're going to spend more time focusing specifically on the things that are related to your field. You'll have some general education in there as well. 
But if you're getting a bachelor's degree, you're going to get even more general education. You're going to get plenty of occupational stuff as well. But it's going to be lots of because we're you know the idea is to prepare people for citizenry and for life in general, not just for their occupation. So, um, but there's a, you know differences in, 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 in approaches to those things. Should it be more general education? Should it be more occupationally uh, focused? To, so there's different perspectives on that. There's also you know our educational systems open access or are they closed access? So. Here in the United States, for the most part, theoretically, we have an open access system. Everybody should get educated and everybody has the opportunity to to get educated. That's, the, you know, again, in principle, in theory, that's the idea. Um, but in other parts of the world, for example, it may be that uh, that women aren't allowed to go to school past a certain age, if at all, or that people of a certain uh, cultural group, ethnic group, something like that, aren't allowed to access schools here in the United States. Historically, uh, if we look back, African-Americans were not allowed to uh, receive an education. Uh, and specifically, were not allowed to, not just that they didn't have schools available, but they were not allowed to. Be, you know, back in the day, people thought if they got educated, then they might not be as inclined to work in slavery, which, you know, is probably solid. That's, that's, there's lots of evidence to, to back that up. Um, so, uh, so they refused them access to schools, which is totally inappropriate, right? But, uh, um, so open access versus closed access, the differences in, in how we view those. Um, as an educational system. And then, even, again, here in the United States, even still, closed access in terms of you know, at the university level, we have open access universities, but there are lots of universities that are uh, closed access, meaning they only accept certain students, maybe only accept a certain number of students or students who have demonstrated a, a, demonstrated a particular level of achievement and so forth. But so anyway, uh, wherever you're, you're going to have differences in these educational systems and differences in perspectives on education. So, um, but so let's focus then a little bit on here on the impact of education on culture. Okay, so specifically looking at it from you know, how does education impact culture? We're going to going to go through some uh, word association here, or, or you know uh, fill in the blank sort of here, where we're going to insert some words here. Education blank culture does what to or for culture right we're going to insert some words here so first of all education preserves a culture education preserves a culture it's how we uh it's, think of it basically as storytelling it's how we it's how we um keep a culture going keep a culture active and keep you know indoctrinating people into that culture so it's through the process of enculturation as we'll, we'll call it that that's oftentimes achieved through education that's how we preserve that culture and and keep it going and uh, so education preserves a culture. Education also transmits a culture. It's how we it's how we tell others about this culture. It's how we inform others about what this culture should be and what this culture is and why they should be a part of it. So it transmits that culture and lets people know what is and what is not appropriate for this culture and how they should behave if they intend to be uh, a part of that culture. Uh, education develops culture. So again, we're specifically indoctrinating people or enculturating people right? through education and we teach them literally what it means to be a part of our society what they need to know how they should behave i mean think about your elementary school classes for example there was probably a list on the wall of rules right so we're enculturating people this is what's appropriate for you to do in this classroom this is what's not appropriate for you to do in this classroom and then as we get beyond that what's appropriate for life outside of the classroom or in your particular profession or whatever. So it develops culture by by enculturating um, individuals as well and, and bringing them into that culture. And finally, it upholds the continuity of culture, education does, right? So it, it, it again, reinforces itself. It reinforces itself. It upholds the continuity and helps keep that culture going um, by telling us that this is what's right and this is what's correct, this is what's appropriate. And so it upholds the continuity of that culture, continuity of that culture by telling us this is how we should behave and, and what we should be doing. So there are lots of ways that education is very specifically uh, involved in impacting culture and that has a tremendous impact on culture what if we flip that around then and we look at the impact of culture on education though right? so uh, we've looked at how education impacts culture so how does culture impact education uh, well i've already mentioned this term a couple times now of enculturation so let's take a minute to think about what that is and, and define what that is so enculturation is the process by which people acquire the values norms and worldviews of the cultural group so in essence it's how they learn about that culture. It's, so from the time you're born, um, this is what you've received as enculturation. This is what we call first degree or first level uh, culture um, sharing. Um, so um, so essentially you can think of it as like 
people we pour out our culture into particularly young people right we're talking about again this is the first level this would be the first culture you learn um, think of it and, and if we want to think of it specifically in terms of language this would be your native language your first language now you may learn another language down the road right but this is going to be your your home language your first language and the one you know better than any other probably right? and, and all the other things related to that culture as well this is going to be your kind of home culture you may learn about other cultures down the road but this is your, the the symbols language values and norms uh, of that culture being poured into people that's enculturation right so the process by which we acquire those values norms and worldview okay? um so you know again think of this like passing down culture uh, to, to to people like older people passing it down to young people and so this is who we are and this is what we believe and this is why we believe it and so forth this is that's the process of enculturation right so it's an en at the beginning of it enculturation means that first degree first level um, sharing of a culture um, and that happens a lot through education as well so education not only in a formal setting, but education by um, the, the family and friends around you as you're growing up and things. That's all part of enculturation as well. But it, culture impacts education through the process of enculturation. Uh, culture also, the impact of culture on education is also three, seen through what we call acculturation. So not enculturation, but acculturation is a little different. So acculturation is the process where people from one culture adopt the process of another culture, which is not their own. So again, when you learn another language, when you go as like an exchange student somewhere and you, you learn about that culture, I had that opportunity when I was younger. It was amazing. I spent some time in Spain living with a family and, and was, was able to, uh, you know, learn about that culture and adopt part of it while I was there and really feel at home there. And that's acculturation. So it was not my first level, first degree culture, culture, right? That, uh, that would be as, uh, as, as an American and, and, you know, other things, a Midwesterner and so forth. And uh, from, that was my sort of home culture, but acculturation occurred when I went to Spain as an exchange student to learn the language and to learn about their customs and learn about, you know, just, so just everything there, just to be part of it. That's acculturation where I was adopting some of the, that culture as part of my own. Right? Now, to know this is different from assimilation. Assimilation is really, you are immersing yourself and just becoming part of your kind of abandoning your first level uh, culture in a sense. Uh, and that doesn't replace it, but it, you're kind of abandoning that to become part of this other culture. Acculturation is more about adopting part of that and learning about it and, and living in it. But, uh, but you're still holding on to that, that first level um, culture that you have. So again, think of it like, you know, you go, it's an exchange somewhere, you make some friends or you, even if you just move to a different city, think of it as you move from one city to another city, you may make some friends and some coworkers there who kind of pour into you the culture of that specific city or that that specific area, that specific group. That's specific. when you start a new job, you go from one organization to another, you, you receive acculturation there. You're receiving tips on what the culture is there so you're, you're being you're getting all this as part of that that process there where you adopt um, that culture as part of your own then okay. you see this a lot as, as well unlike the military for example part of the process of boot camp and things like that in the military is acculturation they want you to learn the culture of the military they want you to use their language and, and use their systems and things so uh, you have that acculturation in the military to make sure everybody's on the same page and and using the same language and seeing things the same way you have people from a lot of different backgrounds and, and geographic areas and things coming together so you want them all to uh, receive acculturation so that they're all on the same page then so, you know, we see also the impact of, of culture on education um, comes from a variety of things, though. Right? So there, the other thing about education is there are a variety of things influencing education. Even if we just look at our formal education system um, and, you know, think about our public schools, for example, that uh, where, where do the public schools come from well i mean how do they how are they influenced right our culture is is uh is kind of injected into our educational system at all levels so obviously you have educators the primary form of of education comes from our teachers and our administrators people who work professionally in that area and in that field and with those schools so that that's their kind of their full-time job right that they they work there so obviously they have a large impact but but we also get input from um from uh, places like parents Right. Parents obviously have input into 
the school itself and the education um, that their children are receiving, uh, and they work with them at home, of course, but, but they're also influencing the educational system by working with teachers and administrators and things. Um, so they're, they're having an impact there. School boards, which are not necessarily made up of professional educators, right? These are people from the community who are in many cases elected or appointed or whatever to, to kind of oversee that school district and that school. And, the, and so you have school boards though that are made up of kind of lay people. Right. They're not they're not professional educators necessarily, but they are people who have a vested interest in that system. They may not even be parents um, at that time, but they have a vested interest in that educational system. And so they they will have some influence there. You also have the influence of state agencies as well as federal agencies. And so governmental agencies that are kind of determining what the curriculum should be and what, what the required standards are for students, what they should be learning about um, in many ways, honestly, um, maybe too much influence here, right? I mean, I, they're performing a role and it's an important role of standardization and things like that. But again, oftentimes these are people who, who aren't professional educators who may not have the fullest understanding and may be influenced by, you know, we see a lot, a lot right now. I, I don't get political in these videos really, but we see a lot of this right now where, where politicians are, are really inject, inserting themselves in the educational system as a, as a political issue. Um, whether they firmly believe in those things or not, I don't know, but they are uh, making decisions that they think are going to be popular and they're, they're advocating positions they think will be popular, whether or not they're in the best educational interests of the students, in, in my opinion. Right, so, uh, but so there certainly, there's no question that those agencies, state agencies and federal agencies, are influencing and impacting education from a cultural standpoint. I mean, they've been very clear about that in recent days about, you know, they want to... Uh, just the opposite. They're claiming they want to remove the cultural elements of uh, from the educational system. Now, uh, ironically, in turn, in doing so, they're actually inserting their own cultural. They're not removing culture from from the classroom. They're just substituting their own culture for uh, for whatever other culture they don't like. So, um, but there's always going to be an influence of culture. It's just a matter of what culture and how strongly things. But so anyway, you have the influence of state agencies and federal agencies. Then you also have just general community members. Again, may not be educators, may not be parents with kids in the school at that time, but just people who live in that area and and uh, and, and will influence um, in many ways, direct and directly and indirectly, influence that educational system. Um, and then finally, and this is not an exclusive list, but interest groups. You have interest groups. You have you know things like teachers unions that are influencing. Um, the educational system, but you also have uh, uh, not just teachers unions, but you have all kinds of interests. You have the the parent groups, right? The um, oh man, I had it in my head now. The one I can't think of now is Moms for something. It's a very um, conservative group that is at the moment involved with a lot of book removals from libraries and things. And I can't remember the name of uh, the exact organization now. But anyway, you have those types of groups. Uh, Any of it's just PTOs and things. Uh, these different interest groups that are uh, that are pulling educators and pulling administrators and, and, you know, making their influence in the classroom known, their impact in the classroom known. Um, and as someone who comes from a family of public educators, I can tell you that this, I mean, that all of these things weigh heavily on, on these people. My brother is an administrator and a school, a longtime administrator of a school and spends most of his time dealing with these types of things, dealing with all these things, school boards and parents and state agencies and federal agencies and community members and interest groups. As opposed to dealing with the classroom, really. So, uh, because they are an important aspect of that, though. So, uh, so it is a, an important part of his role. Uh, but all of these ways are ways that we kind of insert culture into education. Another thing to consider about how we, uh, the uh, the impact of culture in education is what we're teaching. You know, who decides what we're teaching? How do we decide what we're teaching? Um, just as an example. Uh, Winston Churchill once famously said, history is written by the victors. History is written by the victors, right? And what that really means is that the people who are in power, the people who have the power, are the ones who are who are writing that history or the ones who are determining what stories get told and which ones don't, right? They're controlling that information. So, again, if I think back into my own history of, uh, of education, um, again, I graduated in 1993, just to give you some time frame there, but um, I would I, I it would have trouble listing one or two specific things that we ever looked at uh, in in my school, Midwestern school, small town school, that we ever looked at for African American uh, impact on history or really other than just broadly 
slavery was a thing here in the United States. And even that we didn't talk about very much because it's kind of uncomfortable, right? To, to hear about how our country, our nation, um, not only allowed it, but really promoted this idea of slavery that we would take people and bring them here, make them work for, for free under, under abhorrent conditions. And just, I mean, so, I mean, it's not a good look. So we would just kind of gloss over it a little bit. Of course we mentioned it, but not for very long. And then you move on. So I grew up woefully ignorant of any sense of African American history. It just was not a part of, of that because they were not in, you know, in the dominant power group at the time. Um, and still aren't today, but now that we've, we've tried to, uh, to make that more a part of this, I think, but it's, we're making very slow strides at this. But so for example, just uh, for some um, specific context, um, when we talked about the civil war, we talked about how the civil war with the American civil war was about states' rights right versus federal rights should the states have rights over the federal rights economic disparities between the north and the south and uh, and just the, the um opposition to the election of abraham lincoln um not only the the um first but the uh, his re-election in particular uh, but uh, but his election in general because of his his views but so we would talk about all these things these are the reasons for the civil war but truthfully these the i mean these were reasons for the civil war but the truth is it really was about slavery I mean, even all those things were about slavery. It wasn't just about states' rights versus federal rights. It was about a state's right to allow slavery. And it wasn't just about economic disparities. It was about the South's dependence on slavery for their economy, for their agricultural economy. And the North didn't have that. They were more industrial, right? So it's not that the North was just so pure and innocent and, and you know, it was the, just that they didn't need slaves. Okay. And we didn't discuss it that way, but... But that's the truth of it, right? And it wasn't about just the election of Lincoln. It was because Lincoln wanted to free the slaves. Lincoln was an abolitionist, right? So um, it was about slavery. And we never really framed it in that way because, again, it's uncomfortable. And, and you know, it feels like you're putting the country under the spotlight and saying, shame on us. Well, certainly shame on us. Deservedly so. Right? As, a, as a nation for allowing that for, for, at all in the first place and then for so long. And then all of the after effects as well. So... Uh, but we didn't really talk about any of that. I mean, these are all things that I'm, you know, learning about and trying to become educated on now because I've lived a, you know, kind of an isolated, sheltered, privileged life as as part of my culture in a sense. Um, and so uh, I really knew. I can tell you until it became a national holiday, I had never heard of Juneteenth until a couple of years ago. Right. So, I mean, within the last three or four years, whenever it became a national holiday, that's when I became aware of Juneteenth as a the, uh, as in, as anything, and I was I was you know forty five years old at the time. That's incredible to me that I didn't know about this significant part of American history. And again, it's because um, again it had to do with the Civil War. It had to do with slavery. You know, the, the emancipation of the slaves. And so we just kind of brush it under. We try not to talk about it too loudly because it's uncomfortable, and, and uh, so we don't want to do that. Right? Um, another example, you know, in African American history, we're talking about how how far we've. I mean, these are major events. I had never heard of Black Wall Street until a couple of years ago. Again, well into my 40s before I ever heard of, of Black Wall Street, right, in Tulsa. And then, of course, the, the ensuing, in, in 1921, the ensuing um, Tulsa race massacre that happened, uh, Black Wall Street and things, you know, burned out because people were just concerned that African Americans were actually starting businesses and, and starting to gain some economic um, uh, foothold. And couldn't allow that to happen. And then it erupted in these race riots in Tulsa. A massive thing. I mean, you look at these pictures. That, that, they just destroyed this entire community. And it certainly murdered people, killed people, and uh, and just destroyed this entire com community. And uh, I'd never heard of it until a couple of years ago. It's incredible. And I'm, I'm ashamed to say that. Ashamed of our educational system in that regard. Uh, so, um, though, but just for example, you know, you're talking about the impact of culture on education. Well, the victors, quote unquote, victors, the people in the power structure, were making decisions about what we learn about and what we don't learn about. So there's just a couple of examples of how culture impacts education in a very real way, a very tangible way. Think about the people whose history we just brushed aside because it was uncomfortable for the people who were in the more dominant power structure in our nation at that time. Um, it's just, I mean, it's shameful, things like that. But anyway, so an example of how culture does impact education then. Uh, so I want to look at some of the cultural dimensions uh, of education. Okay. Uh, so we've talked about in previous videos some of the different cultural dimensions. So just real quickly, um, how do they impact education in a sense? So we looked at things like individualism and collectivism. And so 
this approach is how we you know approach education in terms of individual achievement versus group achievement and you know again, when i was in school it was all about what's your class rank and what did you get on that test what did you get in that class what what are you going to achieve as opposed to how can we learn together it was all about individual learning individual achievement as opposed to group learning, team learning, those types of things, uh, more collectivistic views on education. Um, you can talk about power distance, um, um, and that's changing as well. There's a sense of this idea of, of the sage on the stage versus the guide on the side, which we'll talk about in a minute, maybe. But uh, um, when I was a kid, you were not to stand up to teachers. There was a very distinct power uh, distinction between teachers and students, and you should absolutely respect your your teachers, but we would never, I would never be allowed to tell a teacher that they were wrong about something or uh, that I questioned their judgment on something. Um, and now, you know, in other cultures, you can, you can do that a little more now, um, especially here. We have a lower power distance, but, uh, but even then back, back then in school, it was a very distinct difference in power distance because it's a very high power distance culture there. But uh, how do we use time? How do we view time? You know, I'm, when I was in school, we were a very strict schedule. I, I could tell you to the minute when that bell was going to ring and uh, how long I had to get to my next class. And, and by golly, if that teacher went over for even a second, I was out of there. I mean, I was not sticking around. I'm very monochromatic. Um, and so, you know, time ruled everything. Um, other cultures, not so much. And it's a little more flexible, both in how we approach the day-to-day -day schedule, but also just how much time somebody spend in school. Well, you know, here we have a very rigid structure on these are the grades you go through. This is the process you go through. Other cultures is more about have you learned what you need to learn in order to do what, you, what we need you to do? Um, that That's how they view that time in a sense. So uh, uncertainty avoidance. Again, the cultures vary in terms of their views of uncertainty avoidance. Um, so how, how okay are we with questioning things and leaving things kind of vague and, and discussing abstract notions and uh, things like that? Uh, masculine versus feminine perspective. Um, this has more to do with how um, kind of compassionate and concerned and caring teachers are. And you always have some that are more than others. But but when I was, again, growing up back in the day, it was more of a masculine, even for fem even for female teachers, more masculine. There was expected to be a separation. Uh, school is not really a place for emotion. Um, but now we've we've allowed to, the, the, those more um, feminine perspectives to come in, which is a good thing where we allow students to to act to uh, talk about their feelings and acknowledge their emotions which are, there are a lot of emotions when you're you know middle school high school age and, uh, so that's great and then just different approaches to knowing how do we uh, how do students learn how do we how do we gain knowledge and um, we're, we're acknowledging that there are different ways that people do that now uh, and certainly in different cultures there are different approaches to how do we how do we learn best how do we uh, teach best all those types of things so finally, just some practical applications to think about here as we think about culture in uh, education. So uh, there are different teaching styles um, that, that culturally uh, will be influenced by um, by, the, the, by the dominant culture, by what's happening there. So I mentioned this uh, a minute ago, but um, I grew up in a very sage on the stage, what we call sage on the stage um, environment, which is the teacher teaches and you listen and you're quiet and you just do your your thing. And then uh, and then they're going to share their expertise with you in the end. Right. And, and then you leave, you go to your next class uh, where they're, where they're going to teach you something else. Right. Um, now we have much more of a philosophy or seeing this much more, what we call a guide on the side philosophy, right? We're encouraging much more teamwork and discussion oriented classes and things like that. So that's been a really interesting transition that's happened really in my time of, of teaching. So it's been really fascinating for me to be able to go from this expectation that I be that sage on the stage to that I be that guide on the side. Right. and work with students and help them work together as opposed to just leading and teaching and, and sharing my expertise with them. Right. And so teaching styles are different from culture to culture, and they will change over time as the culture changes as well. Learning styles. We know that there are different learning styles, and you've probably you know, seen some of these types of things before. Some people are visual learners or, or auditory or you know, um, kinesthetic learners, something like that. You've, you've seen maybe the, what's called a VARC, the VARC. Um, learning styles uh, system, but but also just different um, uh, generations will have different uh, learning styles, for example. So culturally, generations will be very different, uh, and so we'll have different needs, which is very interesting for me as somebody who teaches in higher education. So I see students from lots of different generations, from, you know, really at this point, four different generations that I'll have potentially in my classroom, and they all have different needs. They all approach education differently and, and have different learning needs and learning styles. So 
um, that, that type of cultural impact as well has been um, really interesting and, and something that I think good teachers adapt to and, and acknowledge. Then there's always, you know, it's the idea of grading and power and plagiarism and AI, and let's call it all, we kind of lumped all that in together, but um, how do we approach grading? Is it, is it a firm, um, is it a firm uh, kind of grading scale or is there some flexibility there? Is there, you know, how do you, how do you approach that? And how do you approach power? What are, you know, is there thinking about power distance? Is it supposed to be that I'm in charge and the students are really supposed to just do what I say? Or do students have some ability to contact me and say, I have a question about this, or I have, you know, I'm not sure that you're doing this correctly or, or in the best ways or what's the power structure then in that classroom? Uh, and then thinking about things like plagiarism and AI, especially as, as technology continues to um, evolve and develop. I mean, when I was younger, you had to work hard to plagiarize. It was really tough. You had to go find that information in a book somewhere and then rewrite it out. So, I mean, if you were plagiarizing, it was very uh, intentional. And there was no no real question about, you know, did you understand you were plagiarizing? You absolutely did because you had to go find that information and literally copy it down my hand and things and put it in there. And, and uh, so, but now it's, you know, information is free, right? Information is readily available to everybody. So is it really plagiarizing? If you grab something off Google and put it in there, because everybody has access to it. So, I mean, yes, it is technically, by the way, but, and is AI appropriate or inappropriate? And that's, that's really, a, that's an impossible question. That's not a yes or no question. Um, there are lots of, um, con there's lots of context in there and lots of, uh, lots of gray area in that. So those are things that we're working through still as, as they continue to evolve. Uh, and, and those are going to be different from culture to culture as well. I tell you, I'm somebody who's engaged with a variety of different institutions, uh, both historically and today, um, they approach AI differently, for example, even just right now. Um, some schools are, are more progressive and, and you know, are really working hard to teach students how to use AI and how to use it appropriately and effectively. And other schools are just saying, no, absolutely not. Do not use AI for anything. So there are different, there are different cultures within institutions about how they're approaching that and other things. And, and so... Um, they're, they're, you know, culture influencing education in that regard as well, whether it's culture around the world or just culture from institution to institution um, influences education in, in many regards then. So, I mean, I, I just spent a lot of this is, this is a longer video, but hopefully you can see that culture influences education, which influences culture, which influences education and so forth. I mean, this is just a big loop, right? But culture and education are so intricately intertwined that it's almost impossible to separate the two in a sense. Um, the culture is an incredibly important aspect of education, but education also influences impacts culture in such a direct and meaningful way that it's impossible to ignore the connection between these two things. Hopefully you have a better understanding now of the but the connection and the influence and the impact of these two areas on one another, of culture and education. Um, I would be uh, happy to answer any questions you have about about education and culture and culture and education and so forth and, and hear any discussion. If you want to shoot me an email, or uh, that would be great. Uh, I'd love to hear from you there. Um, in the meantime, I hope that you do have a new appreciation for you know, again, how these things influence one another and how education systems uh, are not only evolving within themselves, but are influenced by these outside factors and, and, uh, and the importance of that education systems have in defining and developing culture within our society.